Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this podcast on November the 16th, 2020. There is some good news on the horizon as COVID-19 vaccines come closer to reality. But until they do, public health measures are still our best defense against COVID-19. Public health officials continue to plead with Americans to take precautions to stem the spread of COVID-19 as the numbers are blossoming in the United States. Here with a reminder of hands, face, and space is Dr. Greg Poland, one of our favorite COVID-19 experts and a virologist, vaccine expert, and infectious disease specialist at Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Greg. Helena, welcome. This is indeed a day for uh, an element of celebration, I guess. Wonderful. Well, we are so happy to have you here to celebrate with us today then. I'm hearing a lot about community spread, and I'm wondering, Greg, if you can explain what is community spread? It's a really important concept. In fact, the, the flip side of that is what we've talked about is herd immunity. So the idea behind community spread, that is spread outside of the hospital, we distinguish the two, is that people are getting primarily infected by small group type meetings. They're not going to large assemblies. We had some of that with Sturgis, but this is small family gatherings, small friend groups, birthday parties, dinner parties, where you're around family and friends that you know you trust, you don't think of them as infected. And they don't know that they're infected because about 40 plus percent of this spread is by people who are asymptomatic, who by definition, don't have symptoms, are not aware that they're infected, and yet can spread it. And that has been the major factor, as best we can determine, in this incredible surge that's happening. You know, it wasn't too long ago, we were looking at hot spots. It's everywhere now. You know, just since election day, one in 400 Americans has gotten infected with this virus. So it's important to look at community transmission because there are community practices that we can do that would protect us. As you just mentioned, washing our hands, covering our face, putting space between us physically, not not socially or mentally, but physical space between ourselves and other people. All of those go a tremendous way. And, you know, I might just mention one thing about this that's, that's, on the discouraging side, we're seeing such a surge of cases in exhausted healthcare providers, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, technicians around the US that have been battling this thing for nine, 10 months now, that we're seeing a record number of people basically call it quits. I've heard here that just what you said earlier, that people are um, transmitting the virus through close personal contact. So Mayo Clinic has a number of employees out, unfortunately, suffering from uh, COVID. But the thought is that they, when they contact trace, is that they're getting this from other family members or small parties they're having in their homes, things like that. Why is that so particularly noticeable with COVID-19 that we're spreading it? The yeah, virus that way. I think the, the primary reason is the ease with which this virus spreads. And again, the propensity and, you know, an individual doesn't know, am I going to die from this, end up in the ICU or have asymptomatic infection? And they're figuring wrongly that because I don't have any symptoms and no, neither does my family, and this is going to be a big issue for Thanksgiving and Christmas, they don't have any symptoms. Um, and we can get together for a small dinner party. Well, the nature of those small meetings is that they're, what to call them, intimate. You're sitting across from the table from one another, having discussion. Uh, oftentimes, alcohol is involved, and then people start speaking louder, um, and, and that's a transmitter for this. So uh, I think it's all happening in the context of so-called COVID fatigue, right? We, we are made as social beings. We're made to be in community with, with one another. And it's been very tough for some people to adhere to that. And unfortunately, they're paying a terrible price for it. Greg, you mentioned that asymptomatic transmission is a big issue right now. In other words, 
uh, people are passing COVID, but they don't themselves don't have any symptoms or don't appear to be ill. Right. Is there a way that we can test people who are asymptomatic or that we should have a testing uh, protocol for that? And in fact, there have been calls for that. The difficult that we have outside of, you know, isolated circumstances or major medical centers like Mayo, the difficulty that we have is we don't even have a thorough and uh, well-funded, well-based national testing strategy for people who do have symptoms. What will get us there, I think, is when we get high sensitivity so-called lateral flow or point-of-care assays, much like we do with flu. You could go into the urgent care center and uh, get a swab, and inside of 15, 20 minutes, they'll tell you with really pre pretty reasonable sensitivity and specificity whether you have infection. That same uh, possibility exists with SARS-CoV-2. And, and the, the specificity is pretty good. If you're negative on those tests, you are negative. The problem is the sensitivity and they still need work to get to that point, but I think we will get there. The one issue that uh, enters into that is this idea of contact tracing, which again plays into community transmission. There are now so many cases in the US that for all practical purposes, thorough contact tracing is no longer possible. The, the cat is out of the bag. We are in some ways, past that because we just don't have the number of people to do it when you're talking about millions being infected. Greg, I've noticed in the news in the past week that as the cases of COVID have been blossoming and there have been more deaths, various states and cities even have started increasing restrictions again. Perhaps it's masking, perhaps it's on the size of gatherings. In Minnesota, particularly notable is that there will not be a public school uh, held po quite possibly until January. Do you think uh, these initiatives are valuable? So for, in other words, someone mentioned to me the other day, well, when they did that in Australia or somewhere, then they just opened everything up and everybody got sick anyway. What do you think about the restrictions and how do we discuss that intelligently? As I observe American culture, we don't have any unanimity. We don't have a we sense. We have a me sense that we've talked about before. So getting people to take precautions has really not worked out well. So then you end up having to make laws because otherwise you will absolutely overwhelm the medical system and eventually the economic machinery of a nation will cease to exist. So the idea you know, what would be the analogy, much like say dental work or surgery, is that you undergo a little bit of pain for a time period with a long-term gain. So when, when I look at it, based on the data of let's say grade school kids, I don't see a reason why grade school kids can't be in session. Uh, it is, I think, pretty clear, many nations have done it, with appropriate distancing and protocols, given that young kids, now I'm talking below the age of 10, don't transmit the, the virus all that well. They don't do it efficiently. I think they could have classes. The issue is for everybody else above that age. And you, you end up having to do various forms of so-called soft or hard lockdowns. Melbourne, Australia locked down, hard lockdown for 111 days, and it worked. Now, what they can't do is relax all the procedures that they put into place, open the borders, let people crowd into bars, et cetera, or it's very clear the nature of the transmissibility of this virus is it'll just start up again because there's so many susceptibles. So what I think we need is what we talked about, uh, you and I talked very early on in this, and that is a layering of protections. You need certain kinds of soft lockdowns in high transmissibility settings, bars, restaurants, gyms, um, universities, things like that. Then you need masking. Around that, you need physical distancing. And then around that, you need a testing strategy that works. How much value is it to go in and get a test and find out the results six days later? That's not very helpful. 
But if we can do this and layer these appropriately and convince the public, ideally without having to make it mandatory, though I think we're going to have to, is how we would you, how would you control this? And I think that's what governors are recognizing. Our state's going to come to a standstill if we don't get a hold of this virus and we don't get to decide, the virus decides and we've got to outwit it. So the, uh, the true, where wisdom lies is being smarter than the virus. Greg, I'd like to move on to that good news we were mentioning yeah. earlier. Dr. Anthony Fauci says that the, cal the cavalry is coming to save us. And now I have read about Moderna and Pfizer and their, their vaccines, and they sound pretty good. Can you tell us what the most recent uh, news in that arena is? Yeah, well, at uh, 7 o'clock this morning, we were awakened to the news that the Moderna vaccine in the, in the first cut of the data was about 95% effective. So, you know, this is a great day. This is a historic day. This week has been a historic week in vaccinology because we now have proof of principle of the efficacy of mRNA vaccines and what we hope will turn out to be the long-term safety of them. Now, just like Pfizer, the, the thing we have to be careful of here in all our enthusiasm is this is a press release. You and I as physicians wanna see the data. We wanna see, well, five people that got the vaccine got infected anyway. Was it severe disease? Did they have peculiar characteristics about it? So this is a sliver of data in the 14 days after the second dose in a limited time period in the subjects that had not been infected before and were a part of this study. So we still don't know long-term safety. We still don't know long-term durability. We don't know anything about children, pregnant women, highly immunocompromised people. Uh, I think there were a limited number of people over the age of 65, even though it seemed to protect them. So all of those things still have to be investigated and we have to know what the efficacy of this vaccine is when it's not vaccine plus mask but just vaccine alone. So a lot to learn, but this is a really important proof of principle that will open the door to new infectious disease and cancer vaccines. That was a really interesting point you made about the mask mm -hmm. being worn when people are testing the vaccines, because you've commented on another show that uh, flu influenza has been significantly decreased in, in some yeah. places in the Southern Hemisphere, probably because of masks. Exactly, exactly. So uh, we'll, we'll see a variety of uh, particularly respiratory-borne transmission diseases be at historic and unbelievable lows among people who wear a proper mask properly. Greg, I saw something fascinating about the Pfizer vaccine. It was mentioned in an article that it requires special transport and very cold temperatures. And I'm wondering, both vaccines being equal, number one, how do you pick which one well, to you distribute? And then what is the deal with the storage on that vaccine? Yeah, this is a really critical logistical issue. So the Pfizer vaccine requires storage at minus 75 degrees centigrade. Major medical centers like Mayo Clinic have that capacity. Doctors' offices don't, pharmacists don't, small rural hospitals don't, and most of the rest of the world doesn't. So is this really a vaccine that's gonna help more than a few? That remains to be seen based on Pfizer's ability to deliver it in the way it needs to be kept. In contrast with uh, the Moderna vaccine, this is stored at minus 20 degrees centigrade, okay? Most every medical center can handle that. It can be stored, and this is the key thing, it can be stored in the refrigerator for 30 days and at room temperature for 12 hours, not two hours like the Pfizer vaccine. So, you know, the way I consider it is this Moderna vaccine was funded by the American public for the good of the world. And having a vaccine with this standard, if you will, kind of storage capacity makes it available to the world. Next step in generation two is make it uh, refrigerator stable and uh, show that it has equal efficacy. So that's an exciting 
uh, piece about this vaccine. One, one difference is that the Pfizer vaccine is two doses, three weeks apart. The Moderna vaccine is two doses, four weeks apart. So a little longer time to that full protection. Well, we've talked about community transmission, asymptomatic transmission, and now a question about uh, individuals who have already had COVID. Do they still need to wear a mask and why? Simple answer is yes. What we are finding out and, that, and have documented is that people can, do, and will get second infections. Uh, we knew this from seasonal coronaviruses, and it's quite clear that it is happening. Now, we don't yet know the extent of it because not enough time has passed. And it's a difficult thing to show because you have to, you have to save the swab from your infection months ago and be able to compare it to the swab from your new infection. Not, not many places do that. We do in a research setting, but not many other places do. We know that immunity will wane, and and, but we don't know when. So uh, in young, healthy people, uh, such as yourself, you know, you might have immunity that goes six to 12 to two years or longer. We, we don't know yet because this virus hasn't been around for two years. On the other hand, we've seen some older people inside of three to five months not only become susceptible, but get infected and in one case die as a result of the second infection. So uh, masks stay on until we have vaccines and until we know the duration of that protection with a vaccine. Do you have any last words of wisdom for us today? You know, I just really, again, want to encourage people here. We are entering in to a potentially long and deadly winter. It's great news in regards to the vaccines, but what you desperately don't want to happen is to get infected, to get hospitalized, or to have something tragic happen before a vaccine is available. We've got Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I, 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 no different for me than anybody else. I would love to have all my kids and their spouses here, but we just can't this year, and we all recognize it. And we want to keep everybody safe, and I want to keep my colleagues safe and my community safe. So when I'm outdoors, I'm in a mask, and I wear it properly. That makes sense, Greg, because when we're talking about this community spread just within our own handful of contacts, et cetera, then you add in people who are traveling from all over the country. That exactly. seems very risky. Yeah, very. And, you know, it, that's how it goes exponential. You know, when uh, your kid comes home from college, the average college kid has had in a given day somewhere around several hundred contacts with other people. Then they co pass through uh, one or two airports. They sit in an airplane perhaps for several hours, then they come home. And you essentially are exposed to everybody they were exposed to in the previous 14 days. That's a high risk situation. We usually get together with a very, uh, very large family gathering at my husband's uh, family in northern Wisconsin, but we won't be attending this year. And obviously, we're very sad about that, but have considered uh, the advice you've given and think it's a wise, wise move. So hands, space, and space. Those three little things are so easy to do. Literally, all we're asking people to do is the minor inconvenience, if you could even call it that, of wearing a mask. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic virologist and vaccine expert, Dr. Greg Poland, for sharing with us today some more COVID updates. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well.